all of that research has, all that fear has been debunked. And actually one of the best things you can do to prevent your risk of cancer is to eat soy foods. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Food Matters podcast, your home for nutrition, health, and wellness education. My name is Laurentine. I am a filmmaker and a nutritionist and the founder of foodmatters.com, and I'm here to hold your hand on this journey to optimum health, transformation, and emotional healing. Hello, hello, Food Matters audience, Food Matters family. I hope you guys are all doing really well. I am super excited to be joined with two epic ladies today. Um, I'm recording from the United States and these girls are based in Sydney in Australia. So I am welcoming Brittany Darling and Jacqueline, Jacqueline Orwell. And so we are talking today about women's health, fertility, and all questions on hormones and balancing our bodies. So I'm going to read to you guys a little bit more about what these ladies have done and their background, and then we can go into some questions. So here we go. Jacqueline and Brittany um, have been on a deep dive in nutrition. When they first started out, they felt overwhelmed by the lack of credible resources around women's health. Now, as business partners, the two of them have 20 plus years of experience in the health industry and know a thing or two about nutrition, optimizing fertility, and parenting. As accredited nutritionists, they are empowering women to understand their bodies and individual needs and take back control over their hormone, hormonal health at any age. Guys, this is such an important topic, and I'm so glad that we can just jam on it because you guys are experts, you've studied, you've done the research, but we are all here out there. <laughs> And especially like our Food Matters audience really would like to know more about hormonal health. So the first question, hormone imbalance, it's a broad topic, but what are the symptoms and what some of the things that we can experience when our hormones are out of balance? So I'm going to let you guys answer that both together or one of you guys at the first one to start yeah. off with. Hey, firstly, thanks so much for having us. It really is such a treat to connect with you and all of the Food Matters audience and discuss a little bit more on hormones and women's health and how we can support people and just get better information out there um, in a really practical, accessible way. So, um, but to dive into your question, um, the term hormonal imbalance has become super topical, um, maybe a little bit trendy, and it's, I know it's been floated a lot across different um, social platforms, and I've seen TikTok responses on hormonal imbalance. Um, so we really want to make sure that we share the evidence-based solutions to supporting women's um, health and hormones. But just as a 101 for those who are very new to this, um, your hormones are chemical messengers produced by your endocrine glands and they travel to different target tissues around your body where they regulate different physiological processes and maintain balance in your body. So um, I think that's a really important part to understand and also because in the context of balance, I think when people think of balance, you know, they visualise something like a seesaw. This is how I always explain it, Right. And balance is represented by something that's very even like this, whereas our hormones actually move up and down like this over the course of the, sorry, I realize this is a podcast. So our hormones are working in a seesaw-like effect, moving up and down throughout the course of the day and the course of the month and, of course, across a woman's reproductive lifespan. So it's never this sort of flat line, even keel with hormones because they're always moving in a seesaw effect. So when we talk about hormonal balance, it's more so about ensuring that your hormones are at their optimal levels, functioning at their best so you too can function and feel your best. Britt? Yeah, so, I mean, to second that, um, yes, your your hormones also include your thyroid gland, insulin, and of course your sex hormones. So, you know, estrogen, progesterone, um, and also testosterone. And of course there's conditions where things like PCOS or endometriosis, where we know that hormonal imbalances play a role in that. Um, so some of the cues for how people might 
figure out that they might have an imbalance in hormones, some symptoms might pop up. So they may have um, irregular cycles. They might even be having things as simple as breakouts. So we know that excess testosterone or estrogen can increase the production in the sebaceous glands of the skin, producing more oil. Um, things like fatigue, mood changes. I feel like most women, well, 80% of women actually experience PMS type symptoms every month. So most of us can relate to those fluctuations and those hormonal changes that accompany the second part of our cycle. So post ovulation up to your period, usually when once your period hits, you get that instant relief in terms of PMS like symptoms, but certainly mood changes um, and, you know, feeling more sensitive to stress um, is also a sign that your hormones might need a little bit extra support. Okay, so next question, PMS. We've all experienced it. We've all been, been there and done that. However, I keep being told and research has shown that it's not actually normal. Can you guys tell us a little bit more about PMS and what it actually is and if we all should be experiencing this? Yeah, so spot on. So 80% of women experience what's known as PMS or premenstrual syndrome. So uh, essentially once you ovulate, this is when you enter your luteal phase of your cycle. So you've ovulated and you start to get a grad, if pregnancy hasn't been achieved, you start to get a gradual drop off of hormones. And this is what can produce a lot of your PMS type symptoms. So bloating, fatigue, mood changes, um, the symptoms can essentially be split into physical. So things like breakouts and bloating and weight gain and fluid retention and psychological. So, you know, disruptions in mood, not being able to tolerate stress and sometimes even more severe end of the spectrum would be something like PMDD, um, which is a more severe type of PMS and certainly needs, um, extra support. Um, so where was I going to go with PMS? <laughs> Sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, and yeah, so although it's not, uh, it's very common, it's not normal. And interestingly, nutrition plays a pivotal role in terms of helping to both balance hormones, but also in the prevention of um, PMS uh, type symptoms. So some of our go-tos in terms of PMS is certainly more of a Mediterranean style diet that's rich in fiber. This helps with overall um, PMS-like symptoms and certainly um, improvements as well in things like bloating and assisting with reducing that fluid retention. And we even know that a Mediterranean style diet helps with um, anxiety and depression. Separate, that's completely separate to PMS, but we know that it provides the building blocks that you need for a health, healthy mood. And people always wonder, okay, well, how can food help with my symptoms? How does it all work? Especially when it comes to hormones, food literally provides the building blocks. So the proteins, the fats, so fats are essential for hormones. Proteins are essential for building neurotransmitters, which help with um, mood, so those amino acids like tryptophan, but also your micronutrients, things like vitamin B6. Vitamin B6 can be very helpful for supporting women who experience PMS. Um, zinc, magnesium, you get all these nutrients through food. So when your diet has been somewhat suboptimal or perhaps the soils that the food is growing in isn't um, as replete as what it should be. And so you're not getting in what you need. Sometimes supplementation can help to really get on top of those symptoms um, much quicker than just doing it um, diet alone. So yeah, certainly our favorites are things like magnesium, B6, zinc. There's also some herbal medicines that have some great evidence, things like saffron. So think, you know, um, Spanish paella, adding saffron to foods. Um, and my other a uh, favorite herd that has a great um, number of research studies on it is um, Vitex or Chase Tree. Um, but of course, when taking any supplements or herbs, make sure you speak to your healthcare practitioner because they may not be right for you. But there is some research in terms of PMS with those. That's, it's really interesting. And I remember when uh, James and I did a tour of Food Matters, we toured the film around Japan and we were invited to speak at a lot of uh, health conferences 
and uh, we were hanging out with a lot of nutritionists and they said, oh, PMS is some, actually not something a lot of us Asian Japanese women are experiencing. We just don't really have that. It doesn't really exist in our culture. And I was like, really? Wow. And she's like, yeah, it doesn't really exist. Um, it's actually quite frowned upon if you actually have that. People are like, whoa, what's wrong with you? You know? And it's like she actually put it down to the fact that they do eat a lot of um, fish and uh, fishy, I guess I would say, that, you know, what we would supplement with in the West with cod liver oils or fish oils. For them, it's really big part of their diet, you know, fish oils and different types of cod liver oils and omega-3s are really high as, as, as part of their diet. So it was interesting to see that um, a lot of these women were not really suffering from PMS in that way. Um, in regards Super to- Super interesting. And one sorry, of the yeah, key components ahead. of their diet is that, sorry to speak over you. Um, one of the key components of their diet, interestingly, is soy foods. And that's not a lot, not something that we eat a lot in the West. So edamame beans, tofu, miso soups, things like that. There is a lot of re robust research on soy foods for reducing PMS type symptoms, but also reducing the symptoms of um, perimenopause as well. So everyone always freaks out. I feel like we were all freaked out about soy foods and estrogen in the 90s. All of that research, has, all that fear has been debunked. And actually one of the best things you can do to prevent your risk of cancer is to eat soy foods um, and also, you know, PMS and perimenopausal symptoms. So, yeah, super interesting. Read the Japanese nutritionists as well with the omega-3s. That's certainly something we see. Yeah. Wow. And um, for me, it's something that I guess I personally experienced with PMS that after I had my first born child, my PMS, um, my, my symptoms started to drop. Is that something that is also normal? Is that something we can expect after, you know, maybe one or two or three children that we don't have such um, strong symptoms anymore later in our latter years of our, um, before we obviously experience menopause? Yeah, so um, symptoms of, or PMS might um, be more prevalent or less prevalent in postpartum for women, depending on how they've nourished their body throughout pregnancy and in that postpartum period as well. Obviously, there's massive hormonal shifts. So if you're not actually focusing on your nutrition and all the other factors that come into play with our hormones as well, because nutrition doesn't work in isolation, right? When we talk about um, helping to resolve PMS or looking at supporting women in achieving better hormonal balance, we take into account things like exercise, stress management, toxic load, you know, all of these factors come into play when we are um, supporting women's health and hormones. So um, whilst you might have experienced less PMS symptoms. This may have been because you might have been so focused and more attentive to your nutrition and diet and all these other factors throughout pregnancy and you were supplementing with all these great nutrients that were supporting your hormones so you weren't deplete. And no doubt you've, um, you understand postnatal depletion. You've probably spoken about it with people before as well. I think a lot of women um, are very quick to... Um, the focus is all on the baby in postpartum, right? And they forget about their own nutrition and health as a priority. We always say, make sure you put on your oxygen marks first, because when you're looking after you, you can better look after your family. So we really do encourage women to look in their postpartum period at how to replenish and make sure all of their nutrition and health is supported because whilst postpartum can go on for years, this is going to help regulate your menstrual cycle again for you. And when you have healthy menstrual cycles that are, you know, full of good nutrition and other factors that are reduced, we know that it reduces the um, symptoms of PMS as well. Mm. Okay, beautiful. Well, we're touching here on a really important topic, uh, something also very dear to my heart, fertility and preconception and nutrition for those that are looking to fall pregnant. Um, I would like to d dive deeper on this with you guys, especially because I know that you've done so much research on this and personally have your own children now. Um, what can women do now that they are wanting to conceive? And sometimes it happens naturally, sometimes it happens by accident. But for those that are having a hard time that are like, you know what, I've, I've tried everything. What could they do if they're looking to conceive right now? What would you guys suggest? Yeah, so it's a funny one, right? We try our whole lives to not fall pregnant and then one day we wake up, well, maybe it's, you know, 
couple of weeks decision, bit of chit chat backwards and forwards. And all of a sudden we're trying to have a baby. So it's a huge mind shift um, element to it as well. But certainly preconception care, and I know it seems so unsexy and boring, right? Preconception care. And it's always such a hard sell to people, but it really does um, set you up for the best chances of conception. So You put in the work before you start trying, hopefully three to six months before you start trying to replete your nutrient levels. We know that a lot of women are iron deficient, a lot of women um, are vitamin D deficient. Um, We need to replete folate levels to reduce the incidence of things like neural tube defects and also spina bifida. And in particular, those iron vitamin D levels, they can take up to three months to replete with supplementation. So if we're talking about testing and finding out where you're at and then allowing three months to supplement and be replete. We really need those three to six months to prepare. So what people, and I'm speaking to my, you know, mid thirties plus people, ladies and gentlemen here, but we know that age plays a really important factor in terms of fertility as well. And what's most important for women to focus on, I feel like we'll just focus on women for um, today, um, is egg quality. And how you can improve your egg quality is reducing your exposure to all sorts of toxins. Um, So endocrine disruptors and things like that, especially plastics. Plastics are the big um, demon here. But focusing on nutrients like coenzyme Q10 can really help with egg quality. So even if you do run into some trouble, say it's been 12 months um, of trying and you haven't had any results yet, even if you do end up going through IVF, you've done all the egg quality work before you land there because IVF cannot help you with egg quality. It can't reverse egg quality issues and they can't test for egg quality issues. The only way you will know um, whether you have egg quality issues and it, you know, and it's not a hundred percent thing because it could be um, sperm DNA issues playing a role as well is when they test those embryos at IVF, they're like, oh, could be a sperm issue could also be an egg quality issue. So focusing on egg quality, coenzyme Q10 is one of my absolute go-tos and non-negotiables for women who are, you know, early 30s, 35 and certainly up, that's my age, um, to to give them their best chance of, of getting a successful pregnancy. And then of course this you know, the nutritional foundations that you set up in preconception extends to early pregnancy. So when you start to feel crap and have morning sickness and not be able to do all the the ideal things, you know that you've got the foundation. You're fully replete with nutrients. You've done the work. So if you have to sort of step back and just eat dry crackers for four weeks, it's really not a big deal. And then we can rev things up again in the second trimester and start doing all the things again and getting optimal and starting to you know, replete again if we have to. But this also sets you up for post-birth. So if you're replete during your pregnancy, you've got great iron levels because we're monitoring them and we're supplementing where where necessary, you're going to be less fatigued postpartum. There's going to be less um, postpartum depression. um, And you're just going to have more energy to enjoy your beautiful new bubba as well. So it really is, they call it the first thousand days. So three months before pregnancy extends all the way into bub's second year of life. And your nutrition, lifestyle, stress changes the epigenetics and the epigenetic expression of your genes, which is then passed on to your baby. So this really, nutrition really does play a key role in this. Wow. I think this is such an important topic, you guys. And thank you so much for stressing this. And, you know, I love you guys. I hope you guys at home or in the car when you're listening to this podcast, I hope you're really taking notes on this because this is really the most important part of conceiving. It's making sure that our body is actually ready for preparing literally for a human child to live in there. And there's so much that goes into that. And as we know, you know, you're, you're spot on when you said we try so hard for so many years not to fall pregnant, you know, to the point where even like, you know, you would take a an, a morning after pill if you skipped one day of the pill, right? And you're like, oh, no, I might fall pregnant in, this, in between this like little fraction of time. 
But then you stop the pill and you're like, right, I want to fall pregnant. And you expect literally that baby to come and fall pregnant the day after. And it's not always the case. And women beat ourselves. We beat ourselves up for this so often. And we also think our bodies is not right. And there's some, you know, then there's this whole like mental chatter of what's wrong with me. And, you know, where do I turn? Do I have to now go down the path of IVF? And so often it's not the case. So I love that you guys are stressing the nutrition element, coenzyme Q10. Jacqueline, could you also um, elaborate on the exposure to toxins during this time and how we can actually minimize toxins, perhaps even do a detox before we go into preconception? Yeah, I think it's really a worthwhile um, conversation, something we're always having with our clients and community as well, because there are just some simple things you can do in your everyday life to reduce your exposure to EDC, so endocrine disrupting chemicals. Um, they're frankly present everywhere, right? Like I always, um, I'm amazed at how frequently I'll walk, you know, into a shopping center or an office or jump in an Uber and they're pumping a fragrance into the Uber or into the center and fragrances are, um, create toxic load or importantly for women as well is looking at what's in the products that you're putting on your skin every day day you know sometimes women are putting up to 200 different chemicals onto their skin based on their makeup and skincare and hair care routine and that's a really simple way just to dial back um, chemical exposure and you know do it in a really simplified way and you feel good and there's such amazing natural um, products out there now that have the same quality as what you might have been used to before um, another really important one that we, um, you know, is an everyday thing for a lot of people is when you're out and about, things like your disposable coffee cups, which are lined with, um, often lined with BPA or other chemicals or plastics, um, getting takeaway containers that are in plastic, you know, there's some simple ways to navigate that. And that is as simple as taking your own cup, you know, not ordering takeaway as much perhaps and learning how to cook really awesome meals at home, no doubt something that, you know, you guys reinforce all the time as well. It's a really empowering feeling when you can cook and know exactly what's going in your food. Not only can you reduce toxic load by not having takeaway plastic containers, but you have an opportunity to pack all those um, fertility nutrients and ingredients into your meals. So really easy ways to do that. Um, so, and of course, you know, looking at what your food sources are as well and that supply chain. So where possible, buy organic, but we know that is not always um, possible for everyone from a budgetary um, position. So where possible, choose organic. I, you know, I can definitely identify that things like dried beans or tin beans are often on par price-wise for organic. If it's not organic, then go down to your local farmer's markets and aim for spray-free, for instance. Um, just be and start to just make some little changes if it's one thing per week or one thing every fortnight to just reduce that toxic load because the science does show us that the exposure to an increased exposure to these endocrine disrupting chemicals increases toxic load in our body, which can impact fertility um, and our hormones. So really simple tweaks that once you're aware, it's very hard to turn away from it. You know, like for me going out, if I forget my keep cup, then going and ordering a coffee is like, ah, uh, I'll just make it at home. Like it's that moment of going, I don't think I want to do that. Um, it's not all the time. Of course, you have to live, but it's, you know, if it's on a daily basis that you're out and about and doing those things, then you can drastically reduce not only your toxic load, but the impact on the environment too, which affects our fertility um, by making some little um, changes. So So what about in regards to detoxing? I remember reading a statistic that said um, the a human child is born with 200 man-made chemicals in the umbilical cord alone when it comes out. And that really scared me. It really freaked me out because that probably wouldn't have been the case for our grandparents and their great-grandparents. And so in regards to doing a detox, do you, do you actually believe and, and do you find that the research shows that it is a good idea to do like maybe a, a juice detox or a three to seven day fast or any type of detox where you're actually eliminating a certain type of food group and you're giving your body an actual break to remove the toxins from your body before you start conceiving? 
Yeah, so your body actually does a really good job of detoxifying itself. So we don't like to intervene too much. We do have a couple of things that um, we do, which I'll talk about in a second. But reducing that toxic load is the most important thing. So reduce on, um, focus on changing your cookware, taking a keep cup, et cetera, et cetera. And then on this side, your best mode of detoxification is through sweat, feces, and urine. So for most women, it's making sure they're pooing every day. Because if they're not pooing every day, their liver's doing all this hard work to detoxify all sorts of things. We detoxify um, hormones, we detoxify toxins, alcohol if they're drinking it, but hopefully not if they're trying to conceive. And if you're not moving your bowels, you're just reabsorbing those toxins. So yeah, frequency of bowel motions um, and supporting it, elimination that way is probably the number one key thing. But yeah, we don't get into sort of fancy juice detoxes or liver detoxes or anything like that. Our bodies do a fine job of doing it themselves when they're supported with the nutritional building blocks. Okay, that's a really important answer. And especially as well, I remember on the Food Matters um, website, we used to get a lot of women that had just fallen pregnant and they perhaps weren't actually trying, but they fell pregnant. And they were asking, should we do a detox? And I was always like, no, guys, don't do a detox when you just fall pregnant because guess where all the, new, all the, all the toxins are going? They're going into the baby. So maybe could you guys elaborate on that as well? Those For those that are thinking about, oh, I need to detox, I've just fallen pregnant and, and are thinking about doing a detox then, what do you suggest? Well, you would never do a detox um, in pregnancy because you essentially are immo- immobilizing those toxins which bub's going to be exposed to. Um, so never, never, never. No detoxifying herbs because they could have potential, you know, adverse um, effects on your unborn baby as well. Um, but, yeah, drinking plenty of water, moving your body, building up a sweat, um and making sure your bowels are moving uh three things that you can do to support normal um detoxification in a really safe way also the focus like remember in pregnancy the focus is on nutritional abundance it's a time of growth and abundance so the more that we can educate people to crowd their diet with whole foods that are full of nutrition they will your body will naturally utilize the nutrients in those foods to support those elimination and detoxification, detoxification pathways. You don't need to do these big strict things, definitely not in pregnancy. Um, and in postpartum, you can make, uh, sorry, not postpartum, in preconception, you can make those simple tweaks with, you know, your Mediterranean style diet, with reducing alcohol, with reducing sugary foods, by making simple swaps like, um, you know, swapping one uh, animal-based dish per day for a vegetarian source of a meal per day, which helps, you know, support ovulation, but also it increases your fiber intake. And that's a really important part of the equation in elimination, right? And that's what Britt was talking about with regard to like making sure your bowels are moving. It's such an unsexy part of it all, but it's so important. Like we can see so much through the way people um, build the foundations within their diet and then looking at also the other side of it, which is what comes out. Um, So they're very simple um, foundations, but really powerful ones to support um, fertility, pregnancy, and postpartum too. Thank you, guys. That's so important. And um, can we actually elaborate on some of the postpartum side effects that we're actually not looking for? So, for example, you know, a lot of people are like, well, why do we make such a big deal out of the preconception? Why do we make such a big deal out of the, the like, falling pregnant nutrition? Well, I always say because we don't want to end up in postpartum looking like X, Y, Z. What can we, what could it look like? Like, I mean, I'm actually hoping for you guys to picture a worst case scenario because sometimes we need, as women, we need to know what could go wrong so that we can actually do something about it pre-conception and pre even, like pre even getting ready for conception, right? So let us know. I mean, I've seen it. I've been there and done that. It's not cool in the neonatal wards. It's not cool what happens. But please, if you guys could paint a picture of what that could look like. Once people give birth, they assume that 
you know, their nutrition doesn't necessarily matter, right? They just need energy to get them through the day. They need caffeine to get them through those sleepless nights and that fatigue. But actually, some of the micronutrients, so your vitamins and minerals, the requirements are higher post-birth. So things like iodine, especially if you're a breastfeeding mum, iodine is a mineral that supports thyroid function. And a percentage of women in postpartum actually um, uh, get a thing called postpartum thyroiditis, which I like to refer to as a thyroid shitstorm, can look a lot like postnatal depression. If anyone's ever, you know, had low thyroid function, you can relate. You're fatigued. You've got low mood. You can't think. You can't function. Um, So it's important to get these micronutrients in, um, especially for breastfeeding mums post-birth. Low iron can be an issue. If you had a C-section, your your blood loss can be higher than that of a vaginal birth, which can, you know, set you on a path of fatigue and not feeling great. Vitamin B12 is a really important one for breastfeeding mums as well. And of course, vitamin D. Vitamin D is our sunshine vitamin, but it's also really important for mood. And if breastfeeding mums aren't getting enough, yes, it can affect their mood and their energy and all sorts of things, but it also has a knock-on effect for bub as well. And we know that vitamin D is also really important for um, calcium regulation in the body and supporting um, bone health. So that's kind of the way I see it. You know, people forget about nutrition post-birth and just think about survival when actually some of the requirements are much higher and post-birth mums need to be supported, you know, equally as pregnant mums and it really needs to be taken more seriously. I'd add too as well that the support for women in the West after they've had their baby is so minor compared to what traditional cultures do. Um, You know, we know that in a lot of traditional cultures they have Um, The first 40 days is like the golden month as such, where the mother really sits, focuses on, you know, recovery, feeding her baby, resting and being nourished by the village around her. And that really is, you know, it's a traditional practice that has continued in a lot of cultures around the world. But in the West, there's this... um, there's this switch that flips, right? And you have the baby and all the focus is on the baby. So people come over and they look after, they want to cuddle the baby. They want to, you know, bring um, gifts for the baby, all these things. And we can't reinforce enough the importance of not only acknowledging that you need to set your village up before you have your baby and identify those people you can lean on and write a list that you can pop on the fridge and say to people, you know, this is what I need help with so I can actually recover as well and function. Um, But ensure that you have some systems set up so that you are getting nutrition in in postpartum so that you can achieve sleep because all of these factors play in to not only your ability to, you know, breastfeed and um, have healthy lactation, but of course the state of your physical, emotional and mental health as a mother. Um, And it is very quickly forgotten in the West. And so our work, certainly with a lot of what we've done with our courses and programs at Day One Fertility has been setting people up for each stage of this, you know, time of their lives for their reproductive lifespan. We educate people in preconception, then we take them through pregnancy and we make sure that postpartum nutrition is a huge part of this equation that comes into consideration for people because, it is so easily fallen by the wayside and all too frequently we see mothers focusing on just wanting to get their body back when that shouldn't be what the focus should be. It should be about how you're replenishing your body with good nutrition and rest and recovery so that you can then function at your best when the time comes, when you've recovered from birth, when you've got your baby into a better sleep pattern and things. So um, it's a big part of the conversation piece and it hasn't been enough. So we're only just starting to see more of a focus on it um, now. So it's good. It's, It's, we love being part of the conversation in the education piece because it's so important. And um, as a nutritionist, um, I'll tell you a little story. In, in Vanuatu, where we live, a little island just close next to um, Fiji, um, there's a lot of malnutrition as well. And I was, as a nutritionist, working as a volunteer in the hospitals, and I saw a lot of, in the na- neonatal ward, I saw a lot of incidences of children being born prematurely, again, because of malnutrition. 
Um, children being born without eyesight, again, because of malnutrition. Um, women experiencing some severe forms of, of depression, postpartum depression, to the point where they actually wanted to commit suicide. They didn't want to be there. They didn't even want to hold their baby. And I think we realize, we are realizing in the West now, we're actually producing a child that needs eyes, that needs a heart, that needs, you know, liver, functioning, body parts. So if we look at it like that, what do we need? What type of nutrition do we actually need to feed ourselves that then we can then pass on to the child? And I think once we start seeing it like that, because the pressure is on, you know, one, once you fall pregnant, but actually I would like people to start realizing that the pressure is on before the conception phase before you fall pregnant. So I love the work you guys are doing. And um, could you highlight a little bit more on, on your specific programs and what you do and how people can um, work with you guys on that? Because I'd love for more people to be able to take part in this. Oh, thank you. Um, well, we love what we do. Um, we really recognize that so much of women's health and addressing um, these important times of people's lives and all the conditions that lie in between, right, in your reproductive lifespan have been so under-resourced for so long. And so it was always our mission to provide, you know, a holistic approach and an education platform so women feel supported across all phases of their reproductive lifespan. So from puberty to perimenopause, many menopause, um, preconception, pregnancy and postpartum all starts with P I've noticed recently too. I'm like, what's going on here? Um, you know, we have um, online programs that are delivered in video content to support um, in preconception, pregnancy and postpartum. And then we've written a series of programs, for instance, our recent um, Piss Off PMS program, um, which is a step-by-step -step guide to help women relieve their um, PMS symptoms and achieve better hormonal balance. We do it all with nutrition front of mind, obviously, and set people up with some really um, simple but powerful changes that they can make in their diet and lifestyle to achieve better hormonal health. Um, it, you know, we want to be part of the conversation always in this and always to provide, you know, a resource that makes women or menstruators feel really empowered by their health. Um, and we continue to do that with every, when every, any time we're thinking of a program or a course we're wanting to work on and release, it's like, how can we make it so it's accessible and achievable to more people where for so long it's one, not been spoken about enough and two, put into a box where it's not been accessible. Um, so that's been our focus is to make this um, a really holistic approach that um, provides grounded education that's backed by science um, and is delivered in a really practical way. Oh, so um, the only thing I'll add here is, and the, the reality is that not everyone can afford to see a nutritionist. So what we offer, as Jack said, is it's accessible. You know, it's, it's affordable for everyone. Um, you know, we've got meal plans starting from $25 and that's, you know, setting you up with seven days worth of recipes and meal ideas and, and tips and tricks as well. So yeah, we recognize not everyone can see, afford to see a nutritionist one-on-one -on -one or have the time, you know, money aside, people are time poor. And so we've got lots of options for people who, you know, just want to get started. Good. And so what about guys, for those that are listening that are not necessarily in the postpartum or preconception phase, and just let's go into some more detail on just some general hormone balancing tips for those that have a sweet tooth and that like to snack. What can you suggest um, on the topic of sugary snacks, how they're not good for us and what type of snacks we could be going to as an alternative? Yeah, so, I mean, there's a number of reasons why someone might be craving sugary snacks, which um, would probably, we could talk about for a whole entire podcast. But some of the things that we address are obviously um, how that person is sleeping. Um, is it, do they have good sleep quality? Is it disrupted? Do they have small children? What have you? Their stress levels. And then, of course, when we're looking at their nutrition across the course of the day, we do find... Um, a lot of women, especially in the fertility sphere, they're trying to be so um, 
I guess, clean in the way that they're approaching their food and nutrition, that perhaps there's nutritional gaps and they're not necessarily consuming enough complex carbohydrates. So things like your whole grain sources like oats and rye and rice, um, barley, or those starchy vegetables like potato, sweet potato or pumpkin across the course of the day to ensure that they actually have enough Um, carbohydrate intake so they get to the end of the day or the mid-afternoon and they're like I just need something sweet because their body is you know you still need sugar to survive but rather than having those refined sugars at that mid-afternoon snack or in the evening after dinner when a lot of um, women become like the sugar monsters we suggest that you just space out your intake of complex carbohydrates throughout the course of the day and of course you can't um you know it's, it's all about macronutrient balance as well but you can't um you can't dismiss the importance of adequate protein sources as well to help regulate um, blood sugar and stamp out those cravings so um, ensuring that when you look at your plate um that you've got great sources of fiber rich foods to lay the foundations. You've got a good portion of protein. A good reference is always, you know, a palm size or palm size and three fingers for fish and chicken, for instance, or a big cup of legumes. Um, And that you have a fist size portion of those complex carbohydrates that I mentioned and a serve of healthy fats. And when you actually focus on those foundations and ensuring that you are having complex carbohydrates, that you are having good protein sources, we do find very quickly that those sugar cravings really do dissolve for people. And it's a really easy way. There's no, it's not hard and fast. You don't have to strip everything out. You just need to work on better foundations. Okay, let's talk about actual recipes, you guys. Um, This could be for a snack or for a salad or for one of your turn to meals. What if I was to ask you, um, could you prepare for me something healthy that's going to help with sugar cravings and that's going to sustain me? What would you guys turn to? Um, I think a lot of people, you know, we say if you're craving sweet, definitely something like a piece of fruit is great, but it's important to team it with some protein or some fat to help um, regulate your blood sugars and also help you feel satisfied for longer. So we know that if you consume a food and you don't feel satisfied, very likely you're going to go back into snack again within half to an hour um, and it's probably going to be more sugar or more caffeine potentially. So have the piece of fruit but also team it with something like a handful of raw nuts and seeds or put a spread of tahini on your banana on a whole grain rye cracker, for instance, or if you if you love berries and they're very seasonal in Australia right now, team it with some Greek yogurt so you've got protein in there um, to regulate your blood sugars. Um, all of those, they're really simple things, right? They're all available on supermarket shelves and you can sort of stock yourselves up well to manage because then you get your little sweet hit because you've got the nice piece of fruit, but you're also getting packs, you know, stacks of vitamins, minerals, you get good sources of fiber and you're ensuring nutritional balance by getting protein or some fats in there too. So Hugo, who's nine, we usually have like, we have some apples, we cut up the apple and then we have some tahini with a little bit of maple syrup to sweeten it and we mix it together and we just make like a dipping sauce for him and he loves it. He takes it to school. He's like, absolutely happy you know he doesn't need any of those sugary mars bars or snickers bars he never even asks for it anymore because he knows that he has those things that he can turn to Brittany, what about yeah, you if i would walk into your house um and your kids are craving something sugary <laughs> what do you pull out of the cupboard oh gosh what do i pull out of the cupboard fruit i don't know <laughs> Um, I see your kids snacking on the seaweed snacks all the time. Oh, I see those yeah, coming out true. of the, Yeah. And the crunchy chickpeas. True. I always see you packing. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Sorry, my mind is not on um, kids' nutrition at the moment. So I'm like, what? Kids' nutrition? Um, yeah, that's right. Yeah, You know what? There's so many things that you can get from normal supermarkets that are actually really healthy. Um, they're fans of, there's some pre-made bliss balls as well. Um, although this no nuts at school thing is a real bugger. It's so annoying, but I love your idea of, um, tahini with a bit of maple mixed in because obviously that tahini is not a nut. Um, so I'm going to steal that idea from you. But one, one thing I did want to say was something I talk about with my clients all the time is the concept of a legume lunch. So 
we know that having more plant-based um, proteins in your diet helps with fertility, helps with satiety, helps increase your fiber intake, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So a lot of people find it really easy if they just focus on having legumes at lunchtime. So it could be a BPA-free tinned um, a tin chickpeas, lentils, something like that, added to some salad, maybe add some tomatoes, olive oil dressing. If you're not pregnant, you could add some goat's cheese. Um, but you could add, 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 add lots of delicious things. You could add some of your crunchy chickpeas as well, just for extra crunch. You could make more of a um, pokey star bowl as well um, by adding some, you know, shredded cabbage and some um, nori flakes and sesame seeds and more of a soy dressing. So I and using um, uh, tofu as your primary protein in that as well um, for your poke bowl because we know that soy foods are so great um, for hormonal health for, you know, for everyone, including men actually. Um, as long as you're not going crazy on the soy, um, soy foods um, don't have a detrimental effect on men's hormonal health at all. So, yeah, legume lunches, that would be my number one um, food tip for anyone who's wanting to balance their hormones. Yeah. Wow. And um, for those that are dealing with, this is our last question. So for those that are dealing with sleep issues, um, that also could be something that is caused by hormonal imbalances. Could you um, or any one of you guys elaborate on some of the things that you would do nutritionally to help with, you know, perhaps it's something you have before bed or something that sustains you what would you do um, for those people that are having sleep issues, perhaps waking up through the night or insomnia or just having a hard time falling asleep, any of those sleep issues that could be dealt with hormonally? What would you suggest? I think I'd probably just want to um, start by saying, like, sleep is the low-hanging fruit in health. And I think it's something that not enough people um, address and they can and very dramatically improve their health very quickly by focusing on sleep. So if someone walked away from today, perhaps, and they don't feel like everything is at reach for them just at this moment, then focus on sleep and look at how that creates a shift in your health. You'll notice that not only do you have more energy and feel less brain fog, um, but your appetite is better regulated. You know, we know, we encourage anyone that's in preconception and just across, you know, a reproductive lifespan generally to focus on getting seven to nine hours worth of sleep a night. Um, and one, some of the best ways that we encourage people to do that is to make sure that they have some boundaries around what they do in the evening. So, you know, whilst especially this comes up a lot for our women in postpartum, you feel like once you put your baby or your kids to bed, that's your time and that you want to stay up and, and watch something because that's the time for you. But then you still end up feeling rubbish because you're staying up too late watching things and not prioritizing your sleep. So making sure you've got some boundaries around your evenings with regard to eating your meal at a consistent time each evening and then allowing preferably two to three hours before you go to bed um, to allow your food to digest so that your body isn't trying to digest your food whilst you're trying to rest is really important. Um, also avoiding those sugary snacks at night um, and caffeine in the afternoon. Um, we know that caffeine can significantly impact sleep if it's consumed after around 11 a.m. Um, so avoiding caffeine and sugary snacks in the latter part of the day is super important. Um, creating a little bit of a ritual in the evening is powerful as well. So it might be that, you know, you've put the kids to bed, you've done the washing up or whatever it is. Maybe it's just you and your partner, but you've got a herbal tea, a little moment to stop and reflect on the day, sit down, breathe a little bit, maybe put your legs up the wall, whatever it is, but there's a ritual around getting into bed. You get into bed and you read your book. You don't get into bed and watch more on your phone or check your emails or check social media or anything else like that. Like you really create a ritual and some boundaries in order to um, draw your body effectively into rest. If you notice that you're dropping off on the couch watching something, you know, your melatonin is is dropping then. You want to be in bed. So recognising when that signal is happening and making sure that you set yourself up better for the next night is a really powerful step to take. So for me, I doze off. Like if we turn on the TV at 8.15, I'm dozing off by 8.40, guaranteed. So I make sure that I am 
rather than downstairs, I make sure I'm upstairs around 8.30, quarter to nine, and that I'm getting in bed with my herbal tea and a book instead. So that would be my first part of it. Britt, do you want to follow on with your um, the next part? Yeah. So um, I, from a nutritional perspective, there's a couple of deficiencies. Well, there's one in particular that I would want to rule out if someone was having chronic sleep issues. So both trouble falling asleep, also waking up tired, but waking up during the middle of the night. And this one rings true, especially for kids. And that's iron deficiency anemia. There is a link between low iron stores and and iron deficiency anemia as well and um, lack of sleep quality and insomnia. So I would be ruling that out um, as a first port of call. But we know that um, nutritionally there are some precursors to making melatonin. So tryptophan is really important. Iron's really important, magnesium's important, zinc and vitamin B6. So although they're not going to work immediately, um, making sure that you're getting them in your diet throughout the day and across the weeks and months. So tryptophan would be in your proteins. Your um, It's an amino acid. So turkey and dairy foods are the two that come to mind for tryptophan. Making sure you're getting enough of those, making sure you're getting enough zinc-containing foods. So um, it mainly your um, meats, but also your, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Seeds. Um, So pumpkin seeds are a great source of zinc and iron as well. Um, So yeah, really making sure that you're getting those um, precursors um, will help. Another one um, for adults, and I see it more, um, you know, women that are done having their children, they love a glass of wine um, to wind down um, at the end of the day. Um, And alcohol really does impact sleep and I see it becoming more of a more more and more of an issue especially in a lot of my perimenopausal clients um so I'm not anti-alcohol I'm just you know if you are having sleep issues maybe consider whether that's impacting um your sleep cycles as well Awesome, 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 you guys. So um, that is coming to the end of our podcast. Again, Britt and Jack, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your wisdom. Um, I love talking to other nutritionists because I love that we're all like, yay, we're a collective front and uh, we're obviously super passionate about getting this message out to more people. So I really applaud your work. And if you guys that are listening and our audience, the Food Matters audience wants to get in touch then there will be a recording, there will be a link in the recording and then you can also be able to speak and talk with these wonderful ladies. And um, for those that want to take part in your programs, you can also head to the website. So I'll post post the website in there as well. But for now, you guys, keep up the amazing work and thank you so much for what you're doing to women's health and changing the conversation around the conception phase, the preconception phase, and the postpartum phase and how important they all are. So thank you, thank you, thank Thank you. you Thank you for having us. Yeah, no worries. So yes, thank you everyone for listening. I really enjoyed that talk. I hope you did too. And there will be more of these on the Food Matters podcast. So head to foodmatters.com and see you again.